Summary of Survival of the Sickest by Sharon Mollum. Sharon Mollum says that survival of the sickest is about medical secrets, and he tells a story about one of his own. Mollum's beloved grandfather was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when he was 15. His grandfather also loved giving blood because it made his aches and pains go away for some reason. Because his grandfather is losing his memory and giving blood seems to have some strange healing effects, Molum chooses to do some study at a medical library. He learns that his grandfather has hemochromatosis by reading about it. Hemochromatosis is a genetic disease in which the body stores too much iron, which can damage major organs. One of the best ways to treat this condition is to lower iron levels through blood donation, which is why his grandfather feels better after doing it. Even though some people don't believe it, Molum thinks that hemochromatosis and Alzheimer's are connected in some way, since hemochromatosis must be bad for the brain. In college, he studies biology, and at the start of his medical training and research, he works hard to show that this is true. It turns out that Molum has hemochromatosis, as do 30% of people with Western European heritage. This is what made him write Survival of the Sickest, he wants to find out why diseases like his that seem harmful to inheritance keep going around. You will learn about how all life and development on Earth are linked in this book. It will also show that genetics is much more complex and changing than most people think. Through this, Molum wants to get the person interested and help them learn more about and take charge of their own health. Molum starts the first part with another hemochromatosis case study. Then Molum says that iron is important for life, but bacteria, cancer cells, and other bugs need iron too and have evolved to use the iron in our blood and tissue to stay alive. Pathogens use the iron in our macrophages, which are white blood cells that fight off biological attackers. In people with hemochromatosis, on the other hand, iron builds up everywhere except in the macrophages. Because hemochromatosis means there is no iron in the cells of a hemochromatic person, the bacterium cannot use that iron to get stronger, this could be helpful when fighting the black plague, which is caused by a bacteria. Hemochromatosis is very common in people with Western European ancestry, which fits with this idea because that's the group that had the plague. Diabetes is the main topic of the second part by Molum. More than 171 million people had diabetes when Survival of the Sickest was written in 2007. Insulin helps the body use glucose, but in diabetics, the process doesn't work right, so sugar levels in the blood get too high. Looks at different kinds of animals and plants show that this could have been useful in the past. When there is cold, grapes lose water and start making more sugar to lower their freezing point. The wood frog can freeze solid in the winter and come back to life in the spring. It does this by increasing the amount of glucose in its blood and decreasing the amount of water in its system. Molum says that because of these changes, people with diabetes had an edge during the Younger Dryas, which was Earth's last ice age. People with diabetes were less likely to freeze to death if they had more glucose in their blood. As more proof of the link, Molum points out that people with Northern European ancestry are much more likely to have type 1 diabetes. This is because they would have lived through the worst conditions during the Ice Age. The third chapter talks about how the sun affects our health and skin color and how people relate to it. Too little sun stops people from making vitamin D, which is important for bone health. On the other hand, too much sun kills people's folic acid stores, which are needed for cell growth and DNA replication. So, skin color changed over time to find a balance. People who lived in places with a lot of sun made more melanin, which made their skin darker. Folic acid can't be destroyed by ultraviolet light because of this. People who spend less time in the sun have lighter skin because they make less melanin. But people who have dark skin and can't absorb enough UV light or who don't get enough sunshine have changed in a different way. The cholesterol in the blood of these two groups rises, and it can then be changed into vitamin D. This means that people from both Africa and Northern Europe are more likely to get heart disease and stroke because they have high cholesterol. In the fourth chapter, we look at how fava beans are connected to anemia, malaria, and a condition known as favism. 
Molum says that favism makes the G6PD enzyme less effective. This enzyme gets rid of chemicals, like free radicals, that hurt red blood cells. Some foods, like fava beans, which contain free radicals, can make people anemic if they don't have this enzyme. Molum says that favism is most common in places like Northern Africa and Southern Europe, where malaria is also common. This is because having anemia can help protect you from the bacteria that cause malaria. Molum then changes topics and talks about how plants and animals often have an impact on the development of each other. For example, plants make chemical toxins to keep predators away. In response, animals learn how to find these poisons and avoid them, so they only eat the fruit or other edible parts of plants. Molum then talks about creatures like the guinea worm, germs, and other parasites. He talks about how many parasites have learned host manipulation, a technique by which parasites change their behavior to make their hosts act in a way that helps the parasite stay alive and reproduce. When the guinea worm is ready to reproduce, it leaves the human digestive system and burns its way out of the skin with acid. This makes people look for comfort in water, which tells the guinea worm to inject thousands of eggs into the skin in the form of a milky fluid. But Molum says that we can stop these pests from hurting people by teaching others about them. Infections dropped from 3.5 million in 1986 to 10,674 in 2005 after Jimmy Carter, the former president, led a campaign to spread knowledge about how the guinea worm changes forms. Molum also looks at how we can take advantage of the fact that bugs and diseases need to live and spread in order to help ourselves. For example, cholera can be spread through direct touch or through water that is contaminated. When cholera is spread through water, it is much more dangerous to the host than when it is spread through people, because people who are infected with cholera need to be moving around. At this point, governments can force bacteria to become less harmful by creating ways to keep the water source safe. In the sixth chapter, Jumping Genes, which were first found by Barbara McClintock while she was studying corn genetics, are looked at as a field of research. When DNA regions were under a lot of stress, they would copy themselves and place themselves into other genes to cause mutations that might be good. It was written by Molum that skipping genes have been found in germs, fleas, and even people. He also thinks that jumping genes might have come from retroviruses, which are a type of virus that can insert itself into our DNA. Retroviruses are master mutators, which means they can help changes happen much faster than we could on our own. Genes that jump around in retroviruses show that our DNA is not always set in stone. While the sixth chapter looks at one way DNA can change, the seventh chapter looks at another way DNA can change. In the relatively new area of epigenetics, it is thought that some chemicals can turn genes on or off, which changes how those genes are expressed. This is what a study of agouti mice was all about. When their mothers were pregnant and fed vitamins, their genes changed totally, changing the color and size of their coats. This happens naturally in a lot of species. For example, one type of lizard has babies that are either big with a long tail or small with a short tail, based on whether the mother smells a lizard-eating snake while she is pregnant. It's possible that epigenetics is even to blame for the rise in childhood obesity. If a mother eats junk food while she's pregnant, the baby may get messages that it will be born in a harsh world with few nutrients. It would then create a thrifty metabolism that would help it store energy better. Then, when the baby is born and lots of high-calorie foods are around, the baby gains weight. Studies have also shown that changes in our genes can happen at any time during our lives, not just when we are young. In the last part, Molum makes the case that even getting older may be planned ahead of time to protect against cancer. Cells can only divide a certain number of times before they lose important genetic information. This is what causes us to age. While this does help stop the growth of cancer cells, which multiply and divide without control, cancer cells have found ways to get around this limit. Getting older is also like planned obsolescence in technology, like how iPods get older over time. It helps us upgrade faster, which helps our species adapt and grow. Molum then looks at two different ideas about how humans might have evolved. 
The first is the savanna hypothesis, which says that humans changed because of the conditions in the savanna and because they learned how to hunt better. Second, marine scientist Alistair Hardy came up with a different idea. It's called the aquatic ape hypothesis, and it says that humans evolved by living in and around water. Hardy thought that this is why, like other marine animals, we lost our hair and got fat on our skin. According to data, Molum says that water births are just as safe as regular births and are often easier on moms. This is more proof that water played a role in our evolution. In the last part of his book, Molum asks readers to remember three things. The first is that life is always being made. Second, that nothing on earth is separate from everything else. Third, that diseases in people are very complicated. He says that we should keep looking for answers and be amazed by the miracle of evolution. About the author. Molam was born in Israel, but when he was 18 months old, his family moved to Toronto, Canada. Molam then went to the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada, to study biology. He then got his PhD in human physiology with a focus on neurogenetics from the University of Toronto. He then got his medical degree from New York City's Mount Sinai School of Medicine. After his junior year of college, he and four other students worked for the King of Thailand to run a home for babies and young kids whose moms had HIV. He has also written a number of best-selling books about science that are meant to be easy for everyone to understand, such as Survival of the Sickest, 2007. Molam lives in New York City. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.